Without further ado, I'm going to introduce tonight's speaker, Ian Harker. Ian, you were uh, in the diocese until not all that long ago, now retired down in Canterbury, um, and you'll be doing some very interesting research. Um, and all I'm going to do is read your title and hand right over to you for what I know is going to be a really fascinating evening. The Church Struggle in Germany, 1933 to 1945. Context and Legacy. Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Welcome. Nice to be back uh, here. Uh, go here, Tony Kent, who's, uh, we um, were parallel to each other for a bit in East London. He's really, really good. He's Australian, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to ask something about you, and then I'll say something about myself. When we talk about the church struggle in Germany, how many people would think sort of? They knew what it was about. Sort of God in me, the style. No. Yep. Yeah. Right. Do we have any A level people knowledge? Good stuff? Any absolute beginners? One, two. Oh, that's good. Uh, well, I'm here. I got into all this. Um, I think without any choice, it all came my way. Now, when I was at Durham University a thousand years ago, by far the most interesting module was a bright young man, um, and his module was Germany in the 20th century, and uh, I gate crashed that, did a, a crash course in German, and off we went for the lifelong interest. Then it turns out that my sponsoring bishop, uh, the Bishop of Wakefield, in the early 60s, had in fact been a student in the 30s and in the European Ecumenical Student Movement had actually met Dietrich Bonhoeffer and knew him. Quite amazing. But what is even more amazing to you is that in those days, the Bishop of the Diocese was in charge of post-ordination training and was in charge of ministerial development, which meant that we, uh, you know, incredibly young curates, met our diocesan bishop five times a year for theological and pastoral discussion, and we got a lot of Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the era before he becomes, as it were, you know, the theme of the moment. So what I'm going to do is talk about the church struggle, the context, the politics and the theology before that period, and the legacy which continues today from that period. Uh, when I say the church, I mean the Lutheran church. The Catholic church might get a mention, but whenever I say church, I mean the Lutheran church. And we, just to be aware, hindsight is a wonderful thing. So, I am going to say um, <coughs> quotations from documents and from how the history of that period has developed, which do seem to be quite stringent. So we actually have to be aware of hindsight and what a wonderful thing hindsight is. 1914-18, phenomenal collapse of German society, quite unbelievable. There's a, a diary of a young Jewish boy in 1918, and on the wall of their dining room, they had the Western Front. And in October 1918, all the Arabs were showing the advance of the victorious German army. Three weeks later, the Kaiser's gone, all the royal families have gone, there's communist insurrection, there's mutiny, there's shooting and firing in the streets, and the Republic is declared with no political party which ever had parliamentary democracy as part of its program. So the worst possible way to try and lift off 
parliamentary democracy after a kind of autocratic but very popular empire. How could it happen? How could it happen that this fantastic empire with its culture and its power could collapse? And then a year later, with the Versailles Treaty, have territory taken away from it, have the industrial part of the Rhine occupied by the French army, and the declaration, they had to accept the declaration of their guilt with huge repayments, mostly to France. How could it have happened? The real reason, of course, is it was the fault of the German high command, Hindenburg particularly, who had thrown in the army to this fantastic advance with no reserves. So once that advance was stalled, largely because of the American arrival, there was nowhere to go. But they, Hindenburg and the High Command, invented explanations as to the collapse to protect themselves. It was to do with hunger, war weariness, communism, and internationalism. Internationalism, a code to the international people, Jews. The bands returned, the army returned from the front with the bands playing, flags waving, cheering crowds, welcoming them back because they were not a defeated army. It was an armistice, a pause. But how could it have happened, losing all this territory, <coughs> being lumbered with the guilt of the war? Now, most people came back from the war and got on with their lives. That's it. But in the big cities, there was um, Tremendous violence. Freebooters, semi criminals, people returned from the front, awash with arms, guns, grenades on the right and on the left, and the people in the middle trying to keep out of things. Radicalization of students, radicalization of the unemployed, and we've got to remember tremendous grief. How could all these people have died absolutely in vain and leave our country in ruins? So the grief is quite an important um, texture to do with people returning from the front. The companionship of the trench and then these deaths. And so it's a very interesting um, niche study at German war memorials which are very, very different, <coughs> very different from our war memorials or from French war memorials. And that, that kind of pictures the desperation of how can we begin again? And the church, the church overwhelmingly conservative, overwhelmingly nationalist, overwhelmingly patriotic, and proud of the empire inaugurated it only in 1870. So the churches, again, cut adrift. No Kaiser, no royal courts. <coughs> the political party which uh, took power, the Social Democrats, had in its program to stop the church tax. Church tax, every German paid the church tax, which then was distributed to the church. That was to be stopped. Religion was simply to be a private affair, so the whole link of you know, Kaiser, royal houses, was church, broken. In fact, the church tax is kept on and is still there. So you've got a defeated nation, the church is part of that nation, feeling that defeat. But even before 1914, the threat of secularization growth of industries, the coming of socialism, and then particularly 1917, the Russian Revolution. All these threaten <coughs> the teachings of the church. And even later, when we look at the Weimar Republic and its golden era, you know, where people talk about not for the church. 
church was still threatened by secularism and by what it called immorality. So the church was shocked as well. The threat of its financial privileges, the threat of its position in the empire which no longer exists. And the strangeness to conservative nationalists of any kind, including the church, the strangeness of a parliamentary republic where there's no kind of clear morality, but there's a fighting and squabbling, if you like, between political parties. We know everything about that. Group interests, lobbying, leadership seeing petty, mediocre, plus the violence of the streets. Well, the Lutheran Church formed a federation. 28 regions formed the Lutheran Church. 28 different constitutions, so that some regional areas had bishops, some had superintendents, some had what you would call the Council of Brethren. The Federation was formed in 1922 with an overall Council of Brethren. And in a study I've done on a theological seminary, it was all going to pot. You had old soldiers, people who hadn't been soldiers, you had staff, some of whom had been soldiers, all arguing with each other about what had gone wrong. Why were they in this state? Why couldn't they uh, heat the college during the winter? And what was the role of the church in the future? <clears throat> now, into that debate, in the early 20s, stepped Karl Barth. Now, Karl Barth wrote an epistle to the Romans in 1919, and then wrote lots of things after that. And I'm going to attempt to sum up the whole theology of Karl Barth in two sentences. <laughs> the spiritual malaise of the church was that it had identified Christian faith with culture and progress. Their terms, German culture, German progress, German advance, German heritage, German values, national values, had been conflated with the Christian faith, so that all Christians would naturally absorb and have these values. This is a false identification according to Karl Barth. So, for example, the loss of the Kaiser have no significance at all for the Christian faith. So why are we all depressed about it? it nothing to do with belief in God. But of course it had been. The church therefore was self-satisfied, comfortable with German progress since the empire of the founding. And yet for that, God is completely other. God is unknown except through the preaching of Jesus Christ and the Bible. The notion of God being active, actually active in German culture and German nationalism is false. And if anybody's dipped their toe in Karl Marx, my goodness me, it was a, you could argue. So if this wasn't polite, liberal discussion. He was an absolute swine in his denigration of others. But he caused a tremendous furore. And again, in the, uh, the theological seminary I was talking about, the whole thrust of Karl Barth was a furious discussion. Jews? No Jews. Well, they'd had a tough incident during the war. When out of the blue, uh, the war ministry decided to take a census of all Jews in the German army. Now, nobody knows to this day why that census was called. We know it was never completed, that there were never any results published. Presumably, lots of documentation lost in the bombing. The Second World War. But of course, it was a crashingly 
a sensitive thing to do. It's like today. Let's have a census about how many Muslims in the British are human. It's in the island. It's a But it did affect seriously both Jews who were in the army and the right wing nationalists who disliked the cosmopolitan in inverted commas life of Jews. And so <coughs> there was kind of minor irritations if you were Jewish. Minor irritations. Unless you lived in a big city and then you might get stones through your synagogue. But the so for example the Jewish newspaper, the main Jewish newspaper, advised Jews what newspaper to read on the train. This is in the other train. So in other words, don't read something that says Jewish Chronicle or something like this in Yiddish. Because, you know, you never know what might happen. <coughs> Most Jews were proud of being German, proud of being part of the culture of Germany, part of being part of the professions, in the theatre, and the arts. And they simply lived their lives and tried to keep out of the irritation because the future of Germany was their future. Now, into all this, there are countless tin pot right wing nationalist groups, completely off the wall, many of them. Pan Germanic, into magic, into going back to the Middle Ages, all sorts of crackpot stuff. And of course, we now know that one of these splinter groups gradually absorbed other splinter groups for two reasons. First of all, it had a frontline soldier as a charismatic preacher, and secondly, it had excellent organizational skills, excellent leaflets, cadres, groups. And they spoke the language of the dispossessed soldier and those who were grieving spoke their language. So it filled a vacuum, you see, not necessarily as a kind of political party with a manifesto like that, but as a dynamic movement, mostly young people, mostly people in their thirties. Compared with other parties, they were alive, they were interested. And they had a clear analysis, crystal clear, very simple analysis of what had gone wrong, a very simple way forward, which could be understood in the beer halls, not necessarily in high polluting gatherings like this. <laughs> Germany had not lost. Germany had been betrayed. What was needed was a new people's national community together, a revival, a kind of national socialism. Well, we're all in this together, except for those who aren't in the big society, who will be the cosmopolitanists, the internationalists, the Jews, the asocials, those who were perpetual criminals, alcoholics, those who weren't committed to this new revival. And thirdly, they had a the National Socialists had a very, very clear economic program. Very important, very socialist, with touches of, kind of communism in there, about debt and loans and cancellation of debts. And the National Socialist movement in its early days, in the twenties, was very much a rural movement. The cities, very difficult because they tended to have strong communist brigades. So it's vibrant, it's exciting, and in the list of their program, they have point 24, which is we welcome all Christians who have a positive desire to see this program through. So people flocked to join the National Socialist Movement. Here was a movement in tune with Christianity, in tune with being together, serving each other, the need for purification, 
the need to be strong, the need for dignity, for freedom, and for bread. And local groups were started right from 1921 throughout rural Germany. Thousands and thousands of people joined. They set up these groups called the Stormtroopers, the Black Shirts. And as part of the regulations, every black, every brown shirt, rather, every brown shirt stormtroop had to have a chaplain. And the chaplain would take veteran services, would take special services for the SA, for the stormtroopers. There were special National Socialist weddings, flags, christening, funerals, festivals, family. All the evidence from veterans' organizations, from parish magazines, from theological colleges, from universities, from youth groups, and from the archives of local churches is how popular this movement became, because it was dynamic and better than all the other riffraff that was around. In competition was common. And certain groups, as I said, couldn't be part of that renewal, including Jews. And of course, the National Socialists, with the Christians, had already made anti-Jewish feeling. The Bible. His blood the upon us and our children. Jesus, when the disciples were locked for fear of the Jews, the letter to the Hebrews, a better covenant. St. Augustine of Hippo, Jews are the bag carriers of Christianity. St. John's Gospel, the whole notion of Judaism, of course, which as you know, is a misnomer in terms of New Testament times. But the notion of Judaism being legal, legalistic, compared to the new spirit of Jesus. You can see, can't you, how it flows in to national social. We are filled with the spirit, not bound by any ancient laws. So the anti-Judaism of the New Testament provided the building blocks for the biological racism nonsense of the Nazis. And attracted good stuff. And by 1932, the German Christian movement had been set up to work alongside the National Socialists for the renewal of the nation. It so happened also in the 1930s that chances of Germany ruled by presidential decree very often without power. So by the time, in order to sort out all this chaotic stuff, a coalition was formed with Hitler as Chancellor in 1933, it was all ready to hand. I like the quotation that all Hitler had to do was walk into a room filled with gas and light a match. And within a month, he had the government begun their work. The renewal of German civil service, where no Jews could any longer serve, unless they served in front. Unless they were front line soldiers. So there was the purification of the civil service. The German Christian movement swept the border, more or less in all the regional churches synods. Synods were dominated by people in the brown uniform of the SS, SA troops. The Aryan paragraph was the one which said um, only Aryans could be civil servants. And that would apply, could apply, to the church because the pastors were classed civil servants, but the government did not require the church to accept that value. But the German Christian movement wanted to cooperate with Hitler, pushed for it to be accepted. 
which immediately caused a famous spin-off from that, backpedaling from that, and what became with Martin Nimoy, the confessing church. The, the government wanted to stop negotiating with 28 different regional groupings and to have one national bishop and one national church, and quite pushed for that to happen. Now what happened in all that argument is that both groups, the German Christian and the new confessing church, both split into all sorts of different factions. The German Christians in November 33 had a huge rally and they went over the top. We should no longer use the Old Testament, we should not use St. Paul, etc. So this was so outrageous that many people immediately left the German Christian movement. Okay. At the same time, the Confessing Church was having its own synods, its own groupings, which in turn caused a great deal of internal problems within the Confessing Church. Two famous synods, I won't bore you with them, Barman and Dalham. Barman said there's only one church, and we live by the Spirit, not God. The Dalham one was further, he said, was the only church, with a proper Muslim church. Now, so immediately, the Confessing Church split into radicals, moderates, and ultra-conservatives just like the German Christians had. Now it's quite important at this point. The, 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 the history studies of tiny regions of Germany or of small villages or of groups of villages show that these splits didn't necessarily affect the working relationships of pastors or senior labor. The illustration I'm going to give and let's not get into the subject, but I'm going to give it, is to do with the ordination of women, church women, and falling in faith. Now, I had, as a neighbour, a guy who was falling in faith, a really nice guy, we went to the pub together, we did all sorts of things together. So it would be in the 30s with German Christians and at the Confessing Church. If they had had used troops going through the forests for decades, They'd still move them together. They'd still have Christmas in the town square together. So this notion of this struggle has really got to be put down on it, put down. And also that the struggle was internal. It was an internal struggle about the governance of the church. It was not about the overall politics on the National Socialist Government, which became even more popular with church people. So there was definitely a struggle, but it was moving chairs on the Titanic. It was while this whole nation was, as it were, being tipped out of orbit, if you understand the sequence. We're down here talking about ephemeral stuff. So, for example, the Confessing Church never ever, whoops, <laughs> never ever spoke in public about the persecution of the Jews. No. What it was exercised by were those pastors who were Jewish by birth, who were Christian. <coughs> now they fought for them. They for that they should not be excluded because and the efficacy of baptism had changed these people from being Jews to being Christians. Now, you will realize that none of this washed in the National Socialists. But that's what they got into. And it, again, there are books which publish the documentation of this. Abs to me, abstruse arguing of the Lutheran doctrine to do with baptism 
and how you were changed. You were different. You were a new person. The whole thing of sanctification, etc. So you were no longer Jewish. Or no relationship at all to the politics of the time. Given also the debate of what's called the two thrones, theology of Lutheranism, throne and altar, which they changed in the 1920s to nation and altar. And it was basically the government got on with governing and we get on with preaching the gospel. And never ever should the pulpit get into any political development of the government because God has set up not in Luther <coughs> as a whole God has set up a system to be governed and God has set up the church to preach Jesus and himself crucified so you can see how all these factions were all over the place I just want to say that, at this point, <coughs> that the persecution of the Jews at this time, early 30s, was all about a limiting ownership of property, limiting being able to run businesses, and one of the, up to irritating uh, bits of persecution. It was only later in the 30s that you get things like not being able to own pets, not being able to have radios, TV. And also in this time, people were being encouraged to emigrate. Anywhere. Anywhere. You had to pay for it. And you couldn't take your money out. And you couldn't take your business out. But off you went. Most of them desperate to get to the USA. And the second alternative will be Palestine. I just think of a joke. And, oh, we're being filled, aren't we? Perhaps I can't tell you the joke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, uh, I'm connected with the Department of Jewish Studies at UCL. And what they have to say is, look, give us Brooklyn, you can keep Israel. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to create a new society in the land of all new societies. No kings, no dukes, no standing armies, a new life a proper People's Republic Federation of the United States. If we can't go there, then we'll go to Palestine. But there was a growing development of <coughs> National Socialist ideology to do with Jewish influence. So it wasn't simply about burning synagogues or humiliating Jews. It was to do with an overall threat of international Judaism. What could that mean? Well, art is a thing that come to your mind. There was degenerate art, degenerate music, cosmopolitan jazz, all this stuff. Um, music and art which were dissonant, which were not harmonious, not creative, but jarred, that would be Jewish influence. This Jewish influence would also include Jewish influence in physics, wait for it, Jewish influence in landscape gardening. <laughs> right now we're getting into the potty. Um, but there were people writing books who were academic studies on the Jewish influence in all sorts of disciplines, country dancing, folklore, and of course theology. Jewish influence. Now, Hitler got totally fed up of all these arguments. Uh, one or two pastors were in prison, they went too far. Um, so, abruptly, 1935, he set up the Ministry of Church Affairs in Berlin to sort out the church, churches actually, and to try and bring some pacification of what was going on, of all the arguments. Now, this ministry is a study in itself to do with church and to do with the nation, the notion of the Third Reich 
of National Socialism. Who set this ministry up? Who set it up? This became a huge debate for about you know, five minutes, two or three months. Who had set up this ministry? Now it was Hitler that said to whoever set up a ministry to sort out the church. So was it a party ministry, a national socialist ministry, or was it a government ministry? Because who paid would be different. And there were memos and arguments about the legality of setting up this ministry. It also demonstrates <coughs> the, the chaos of national socialist rule in the Third Reich. The ministry was set up, church staffed by lots of priests, ex-priests, pastors, nuns, and uh, to sort out the church. But within that were people who were actually secret SS members, who reported back to the headquarters of the SS about what was going on in the Ministry of Church Affairs. <coughs> the Ministry of Church Affairs was actively opposed by certain senior Nazis, people like Rosenberg and Warren, who opposed its existence. However, it existed, it was bound to fail, they created committees of confessing church and German Christians and the central, normal Lutheran peoples, as it were. They lasted for a few minutes, a few hours, a few days, a few years, but then it all collapsed. And by 40, 41, the whole ministry was quietly forgotten. In 1936, the members of the confessing church finally finally, sent a memorandum to Hitler about all the illegalities of the Third Reich, the Gestapo, the violence, the secrecy, the denunciation. And there's a very, very interesting book which traces the development of that memorandum. It went through three different drafts, and they went away, you know, and did another draft, and brought it back. And finally, they got to the fourth draft. And only in the fourth draft was there a small paragraph deploring action against Jews in general, not simply Jewish Christians. A small paragraph. This memorandum was taken by hand to the Chancellery, no reply. Nothing happened ever. So the body of the Confessing Church decided to summarize the memorandum, publish it, and ask Confessing Church pastors to read it in the pulpit, except the paragraph about the Jews was omitted. So you see, you've got here uh, churches which are still frightened of causing too much offense. And there are some historians who see the financial support of the state, which was still happening, the financial support of the state being a really important reckoning in how their theology worked out. But without the financial support of the state, they couldn't continue. Memorandum in 36. In 1939, the Institute of Jewish Influence was set up. What about the Hebrew scriptures? Shall we use them? Liturgy? Shall we have Jewish phrases in David, Zion, Jerusalem, in our hymns? Now, <coughs> there are university PhDs being written about this kind of thing in prestigious universities with prestigious lecturers and supervisors. Jesus came from Galilee. Now it's known that in the deportation to Babylon, lots of Jews from Galilee were deported off to Babylon, and in came lots of non-Jews. That explains Jesus, not Jewish at all, the Galilean. And in fact, Jesus stands as 
the victor over Judaism. He is the model as the victor of over Jews, who are the mortal enemies of those who follow Jesus. Now I'm going to name some names. And I don't know how many people will register these names of people who were involved in the Institute. Gerhard von Rad. Gerhard von Rad wrote Genesis and 80,000 volumes on the book of Genesis. Kittel, theological workbook of the Bible. Hirsch, Althaus, Boltzmann, and not a theologian, but a philosopher, Heidegger. Now these are all kind of, if you're into all this, these are famous men who were beavering away about the Jewish influence in, on the theology. In 1941, there was a conference of the security services and it was agreed to stop all action against churches. If the, where there had been to stop it until the end of the war. And just to come back to the wider context again, remember the huge popularity and the huge success of the National Socialists. The Treaty of Versailles overturned. State visits from everybody under the sun, including the Duke of Windsor, tourism, employment, the Ruhrbach, the Olympic Games, Austria, Reunited once again, the threat from Poland overcome, the threat from France overcome, and then, at last, the war against atheist Bolshevism in the name of German Christian value. So the church is really now, now a church is finished now, because there's this hugely popular war. And to step out of line in any way, not that the church as an institution had stepped out of line, but it was now possible. In terms of historians, also what's happened lately by the last 25 years is that the war in the East has moved centre stage. Not the Western Front, but the war in the East. And also, in terms of the war in the East, the Holocaust. This came about the Eichmann trial and then various other trials and plays and documents. But some, not some, but gradually the realization <coughs> that Christian Europe, headed by Germany, had attempted to kill, to murder all the Jews of Europe. Not only to murder them, but to, but to take part in gratuitous brutality. We're talking about Jews being rounded up and forced to do PE or forced to run around and making noises like pigs or rabbis having their beards cut with gardening shears, babies thrown in the air and shot, etc. We know all this. I'm not going to I'm not going to kind of uh, chill us all, but we do have to we do have to take that on board in terms of the role of the church and the theology of the church. Now, not only in Germany, but we could now look, if we wanted to, at the church in Poland, Lithuania, Ukraine, Estonia, Latvia, France, Belgium, Netherlands, Italy. And that will give us a whole different flavour in our take on the church in Germany. 1945, total collapse, and about to finish. The churches immediately positioned themselves as resistors of Hitler. But they had stood firm against national socialism. Now you have to remember that even though the victors were sinking in documents, just thousands and thousands and thousands of bombs full of documents, they didn't know. Plus, also, the style of the American army, <coughs> which was much more open than the rather cynicism of the British army. 
the American army welcoming bishops or clergy who were saying, you know, we, we resisted all along, we opposed all along, and here we still are. And we have a role in the new Germany. They saw Germans as victims, victims of the Hitler gang, as I saw it, victims of the SS, victims of the Red Army, as they had come from Eastern Germany, and victims of the terror bombing. And the churches, the church, stood for these kind of victims as against any arrogance that the occupiers might have. And the official statements use what I would call theological fog. Listen to this. Through neglect and silence, we too are guilty of the crimes committed against the Jews by members of our people. Members of our people. By members of our people. We ask the God of compassion to bring about the day of fulfillment when we will sing the promises of the victory of Jesus with the rescued Israel. So again, no change in its theology towards Jews. War crimes, apart from the big Nuremberg, famous Nuremberg trials, the church opposed war, the trial of war criminals, saw them as prisoners of war caught up in a horrific brutal war in the East. So the churches formed an opposition to the war crimes trials, not, not the great big one, not the famous one, but the subsequent one. And bishops talked about American justice. Many of the judges were Jews. An alien legal system. There was also what's called denazification, whereby the Allies had to make sure that they didn't appoint people who would be you know, supporters of National Socialism. And you all had to have a certificate if you could continue as a teacher or what have you, or as a pastor. Now, the central office of the Lutheran Church issued a pro forma for its pastors to be able to write certificates for whoever to say they'd never been a socialist, national socialist, they'd always striven, they were always good outstanding Christians. Perselsheimer, Whitewash, Perselsheimer. So the church was actively involved, this is in the 50s, in defending people still in prison. This is not true, of course, of East Germany, where the German Democratic Republic declared it had no ex-national socialists in Eastern South Poland. <laughs> Along comes the blockade of Berlin by the Russians, 1948, the creation of the two Germanys, 1949, the Korean War, 1951, and suddenly the Soviet Union in charge of the whole of Eastern and Southeastern Europe, the whole of it. So suddenly the United States needs a bulwark against communism. It needs a democratic West Germany. What about a new German army? Now, Conrad Adenauer, Chancellor, convinced Democrat, was here very, very, very skilled. And he said to the American administration, a German army, we can do that. But not while we have German soldiers classed as war criminals still in prison. And so, by 1958, all war criminals have been let free. I mean, there have been commissions of uh, sentences before. And now, of course, you've got the situation where you can't move in Germany now for Holocaust Museum, Holocaust Memorials, books about the involvement of Volkswagen, Deutsche Bank, Swiss accounts, the yeah, memorials, a traveling exhibition about the actions of the German army, not the SS, the German army, 
in Old Eastern Front. Traveling exhibitions about local church involvement. Schools doing projects on the labor camp that had existed around the corner. And in doing that project, finding that the farmer is threatening to shoot them if they don't leave his hand. So it's all very much with us still. And the huge theological change through Vatican II and through the Lutheran World Federation. A change which is not percolated down to the pews. The change being the recognition that the Jewish covenant still stands. God's covenant with Jews still remains. They are still favoured. That within Judaism is all the fruits of Christianity. Atonement, sanctification, purification, the Trinity, if you look hard enough, etc. The proliferation of books as Jesus is the Jew, <coughs> Jesus as a radical Pharisee, Jesus as a good Jew, as a reformed Jew. The implications of all this for our theology today are just absolutely enormous. But the, the, the Vatican went so far as to issue documents about how to preach when the text looks like an anti-Jewish text. The one that I quoted, the disciples were in the room locked for fear of the Jews. A nonsense phrase, because they're all Jews. Mm -hmm. So how do you preach on that? What's behind that phrase, for fear of the Jews? St. John's Gospel, a fantastic prologue. He came to his own, and his own knew him not. Uh, who, who, who did he He came to his own, and his own knew not. Who? Who are these own? Millions? Millions of Jews? Or the 500? Do you understand where I'm getting at? There's huge um, ramification still in our theological concern about Jesus as a Jew, and about facing how could it be that Christian Europe was involved in the murder of the major. Thank you. <coughs> <coughs> Thanks ever so much. Okay. Um, that's been a really fascinating, um, albeit uh, you've, you've had to like, squeeze it into one hour only, uh, kind of run through um, a really complex uh, piece of history, that's right. Um, and you've kindly agreed um, the time now to um, yeah, I'll, perhaps I'll take your responses, questions, um, which we can do now. So you've got a hand up over there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Could you say something more about um, exactly what the respective positions of um, the Confessing Church and the German National Church were um, on the question of? Um, the two thrones, I think you called it. You know, well, I sort of think of it as church state. Yeah. Because it seems to me that that's, um, that is likely to be an absolutely crucial um, issue, and possibly more crucial than um, a number of the things that you mentioned. It, uh, it's classic Lutheran doctrine, which we don't have. I mean, we may yeah. have the same sort of view, but, <coughs> you know, for anybody who knows anything about Lutheran doctrine, it is as clearly fixed as a Roman Catholic doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the training to be a, a Lutheran pastor is much, you know, very, very dense and very long. And part of that is the two thrones, which is that um, once you start raising questions about society, that's not the role of the church. The role of the church is to preach Jesus and him crucified. And sorting out society is the role of the government. Now, um, the German Christian movement had no problem with that. 
the bulk of the confessing church had no problem with that. Where they got split was through, I'm going to mention the name, was through radicals like Bonhoeffer. And Bonhoeffer was crystal clear that what faced the church was a persecution of the church. And he got so, can I use the phrase pistol? <laughs> he got so pissed off with the Protestant church that he left twice. He came to London because he couldn't stand the divisions of the Indian Confessor Church. And he left again in 39 to go to the state. Did everybody take the same line no. on the question of church and state? What was the what did people disagree about in relation to that? And the second thing. Although they might feel that, that, that the state had its, uh, you know, that, that, that the church shouldn't get into telling the state, how about if the state steps over and starts telling the church what to do? Did some people have views about that? Because I think that could be quite a yeah, They did as well. They did. The second one, they certainly had views, where the state was saying, we want all these 28 regional things to go, and then one national church with a national mission. And that caused lots and lots of opposition. In the German National Church or the Confessing Church? Or no, they were. Confessing Church was fine with it. The mainline Lutheran Church was fine with it. Confessing Church saw it as interference in the government of the church. But in terms of what you might call the social policies of national socialism, they didn't have it. They were as nationalist uh, as anybody else, they were as enthusiastic as anybody else, yes, apart from. People like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who became extremely unpopular, I mean, very, very unpopular man, uh, who used his students. You know, he, at one point he was running a, a confessing church theological college. Well, he used to bus his students to synods, to heckle, to leave them, to heckle government speaking. Now, this is all in Bethke's book, which he wrote in. 50 something was it? 58? Big biography of Bonhoeffer. But it's all hidden because it's such a big book. But it's quite clear that Bonhoeffer was not liked. He was young, yeah, he was intelligent, he was influenced by Karl Barth, who wasn't even Lutheran, but reformer. And Bonhoeffer disrupted, he continued the disruption of the church. When Lots in the church, by the time you get to the late 30s, we just want you know, the whole thing to die down. Because there wasn't going to be a national church, there wasn't going to be a single national bishop, but you have done. Yeah. Um, and the, the other story of Bonhoeffer, which I'll just leave with you, in 1945, the uh, Council of Brethren of Berlin visited Bonhoeffer's parents, because the local primary school wanted to change its name to the Dietrich Bonhoeffer School. And the Council of Brethren said to his parents, will you oppose this? Because he's such a divisive group. So it's another ramification of the development of, of history. This is not to say, of course, historically, you know, and a tremendous, grave, lonely person. Mm -hmm. uh, and his theology I leave to others to, to work out. But it is, if I use the phrase alibi of a nation, not now, but at one time, Bonhoeffer was the alibi of a whole nation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Lydia at back and then David. Bonhoeffer, you just said he foresaw what was going to happen to the Jews. Now, probably lots of other people did too, lots of other Christians, lots of other pastors, lots of other priests. Um, but if they had spoken out, many of them, and I'm not saying this is right, but many of them would not have been able to help those many Jews who were helped secretly because it would have jeopardized 
they would have been discovered and they would have been punished and they wouldn't have been able to do what they were doing. So I mean, it's a, it was a kind of no-win situation. I, I mean, I think you're, there's a lot in that and, and what I said about hindsight. However, there's little documentation about help for you. There's some, but there's little. And what little there was was often stopped or found. But what about the things we don't care about? I mean, I know that Corrie ten Boom wasn't German. Um, she was Dutch and all that she did and her family did to help the Jews um, yeah. sort of undercover and, and suffered for it greatly. There must have been so many other people that, that she knew and, and... Well, well, you can't write history in terms of there must have been. No. There's no doubt there were people who did. Obviously an uncle Gruber, the Gruber office in Berlin, a woman called Elizabeth Schmidt, who wrote, uh, who was a social worker in Berlin, who wrote a huge document to do with young Jewish people being hauled out of swimming pools, etc. Presented this to her synod, and the presiding, the lay, the lay president refused that he should go on the agenda because it would disturb it because of Islam. Um, a very famous Catholic priest, Lichtenberg, who in the th late 30s uh, in the Berlin Cathedral set up uh, an evening rosary for Jews, <coughs> to pray for Jews. Uh, he was arrested and killed. But, you know, the number of pastors who were arrested and killed mm -hmm. in that time. But there were also, I mean, I have great friends, the Sisters of Zion, um, who's, who's thing is Christian Jewish relations and they've been yeah, yeah, for yeah. 150 years yeah. and I mean there were even nuns in Europe and not just those nuns yeah. who were doing a lot to Yes, <coughs> there were. Um, most of the documentation, not much of the documentation comes from Germany. Mm -hmm. France, mm -hmm. Belgium, mm -hmm. Poland. David, did you say that J.P. Taylor in his book, The uh, Course of German History, doesn't mention the Lutheran Church. Do you think he should have? Yeah, I mean, his book is. You wouldn't recommend it to students anymore. Mm -hmm. It's kind of written on the back of an envelope. <laughs> That's unfortunate. Um, A.J. Taylor's books are not. Phrase is. They're not on any undergraduate syllabus. Yes, that is, why is, that? is, it, is it just um, cool. quality is history. no longer applicable? Cool. It's not based on documents, most of it is based on his opinion. Mm -hmm. But not mentioning the Lutheran Church would be significant mm -hmm. in itself. Mm -hmm. They <laughs> didn't actually do it. Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah. Professor McDermott McCulloch, in his history of Christianity, started at the point where the Syrian church spread eastwards in a great sense of freedom, and of course the Pauline church spread throughout Europe. Then along came Constantine, then later the Holy Roman Empire, Spain, Italy, <coughs> Austria, uh, and so on. Then Henry VIII, Supreme Head of our, our Church here, uh, and so on. Do you think the Church has benefited from its connection with the state, or has it actually taken something of the truth of the message of Christianity away uh, from its behaviour? That's a pretty big question. Well, personal reliance at the moment. Yes. Well, uh, we all go and live in France, in the France. <laughs> Where the state pays for the church buildings to be made. Oh, really? Yes. 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 Yeah. Well, I, 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 okay. I, I need a weekend's conference. Yes. <laughs> but I like a Jewish um, historian's statement. There is no history of Christianity 
without the history of the church. So you can talk, we can talk all we like about delightful Christian religion. But we actually have to focus on the actions of the church. So, I mean, uh, it's not answering your question properly, but it's, it's saying that the, well, it is in a way, it's saying that the actions of the church, the actual action, are as significant, if not more significant, than the theoret theoretical doctrine of the church. Um, and certainly, many of the documents of regret that came out in the 1940s and 50s are full of what I call theological fog. Uh, there's a famous phrase, we did not pray enough, we did not uh, rejoice enough. Anyway, it's all this fog. Lenin called it theological fog, yeah. which descends on injustice and mud is on the road. So, um, I mean, it, we just have to face the fact that Christianity boomed on the back of armies. Colonialism. And we're still living with it, aren't we? Africa, bits of Europe, we're still living with all this. Ukraine, and so on. It'd be interesting to know whether you think there's a theological fog around at the moment, but perhaps we won't think of that. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect theological fog is uh, one of those persisting <coughs> phenomena. I was quite struck in when you were talking about Karl Barth, yeah. um, and that was really helpful for me. I mean, it's, it's difficult to summarise Karl Barth in a couple of sentences, but actually you, you, you did a good job there, I thought, in terms of um, the reminder that he wanted to um, escape from the, the, what had been the theological paradigm of a kind of state, the glory of empire, and how how Christianity kind of undergirded that um, in terms of human progress and a kind of linked mm. progress towards God yeah. with, with yeah. worldly progress. And he wanted to, to lean away from that and so kind of pared it down to the cross and the bridge, which is Christ, leading us to God. But there's a bit of an irony, it seems to me, because the way the churches became hooked into the Nazi movement turned out to be about another version yeah. of worldly Absolutely. progress, yeah. Absolutely. a new version, yeah. Yeah. a new Absolutely. empire. Yes. So, um, so what does that mean in terms of that, that, that Barthian influence? Um, well, Bart, in the 50s and 60s, wrote some very interesting essays about the mistakes he thought he'd made mm. in the 30s. The other, the reason why Bonhoeffer was disliked was not only that his mentor was reformed, Karl Barth, but he was also Swiss, so he wasn't even German. Um, and he regretted that he hadn't spoken more about the dignity of Jews. And he regretted that he hadn't spoken more. Interestingly enough, he regretted that he hadn't been as brave as he realized. Uh, and lots of stuff about Bonhoeffer, Karl Barth hadn't realised until he read Lesker's book. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, Barth came to regret a great deal of what he'd said and done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm quite interested, just to kind of follow up on that, um, with the whole theme of progress, really, as, as a theological idea and also as a... <coughs> as a kind of political idea as well. And it seems to me that the rise of, of the kind of modern nation state and, and modern philosophies has invested the whole idea of progress with a whole new lot of baggage yeah. um, and kind of links to our consumer society almost, I think. And I'd argue that. Whereas, whereas the old idea of pilgrim's progress has really been lost. And I think there's a real danger for us as Christians and churches today that we've We've, we've kind of reinterpreted what true Christian progress could be and kind of we've allowed it to become trapped by our by those modern political and philosophical ideas of what progress is. I don't know if that yeah, makes sense. Yeah, it does. I think it links a bit with that question yeah, about yeah. the state and uh, I mean I, I think of uh, the notion that uh, 
we are in this country we are to for build a big society but certain people are quite in that big society Muslims are they in? would benefit scroungers be in the big society you see where I'm getting at now once you start traveling down that way and then it's, it's then occurring to me that the church, certainly the church in England, is in a far better position now than it's been for a long time. I mean, it is leading the opposition, isn't it? Yeah. All the bishops, Archbishop Kennedy. And, and people say that the bishops are more liberal than the congregations. Yeah. Um, and that um, so what we've got is a church which might finally with, with all sorts of other churches be taking on the Jewishness of Jesus come back to that in plus Roman Catholic option for the poor exemplified now by the new pope. Mm. So it may be the Church of England is kind of intertwining those two. The Jewishness of Jesus is, I think, really important because modern day Jews say, let's not discuss God. Let's be God. Let's do something. Let's be altruistic. Let's be merciful. Mm. When there's a catastrophe, let's not say, where is God? Let's get on with it and rebuild God. That's one of the Jewish reactions to the Holocaust, by the way. And there are some more. Um, so it may be that uh, and the Jewish religion is very, very firmly now widows, orphans, bread, doing good. Yeah? There are Jews who say there's no Jewish theology. There's no such thing as Jewish systematic theology. There's no doctrine. All there is is there's one God, and you must love him and your neighbor as yourself. Finish. Okay. Now it may be that it's percolated through to our bishops that version of Judaism. People talk about you know, the Jewish Christian attributes of our society. Actually, I would have thought 99% Jewish, 1% Christian. Now, I might be being a bit harsh there. Do you understand what I'm trying to say on that? That the, the Jewishness of Jesus is different from the Christian Jesus. It's different. In terms of theology, doctrine, teaching, sacraments. It's all I. I mean, I'm quite clear through reading Jewish theology that the whole of Christian theology is within Judaism. But it's called something else. So atonement, we all have to atone for the sins of the world. All of Nobody does it for Which is a very communist. Uh, <laughs> you, I mean, I'm now getting on the high horse, so I'll stop. Yeah, uh, the, 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 legacy of, the legacy of the period that we've been talking about is very much the Jewishness of Jesus. That's certainly very interesting, isn't it? Chris. Yeah, um, just, if I could just jump on the back of your horse. Um, I, I wonder whether this is actually a problem particularly with Lutheran, which seems to be a kind of subject in what you were saying, um, in that... Um, you know, much as I have tremendous respect for, for Martin Luther, but the focus on Luther's particular version of what St. Paul was saying, or thought, thought, he, thought that St. Paul was saying, um, rather eclipsed what's actually the gospel was in Jesus as a, as a person, and as a prophet, and as a Jew, of course. Um, so, that, so that some kind of doctrinal construct is rather overwhelming the actual practice 
of love of God and love of neighbor. Um, I, is, is, that, is that fair as a... As no, a I agree completely. I agree completely, except I think it would apply to any Christian tradition. If God's covenant with the Jews remains, what is this new covenant of Jesus? Um, if Jesus was celebrating the Passover, what do we celebrate? When we call it the Last Supper. So I think uh, the whole thing of Trinity, all, all our doctrines get in the way. Because they're there. And there are people who are uh, Christian theologians who say the New Testament is a thoroughly Jewish absolutely And St. Paul, uh, a wonderful uh, series of writings about all Romans, chapters 8 to 11, <coughs> where it says about 10 different things about the Jews. And Christian tradition has only picked up one. Yes. Um, you were fairly scathing a few minutes ago about the GP table. Uh, I just wonder whether historians are a bit like women's fashion and they, they come in the way. So, I mean, you, you I remember back in the 60s and 70s, um, it, uh, you, Trevor Rota, was very popular. Yeah. Um, I particularly liked his point that he made in one of his lectures that um, whereas the accepted opinion was that. Um, Hitler was regarded as uh, uh, a, a sort of exception, um, but he maintained quite strongly that, on the contrary, the military used Hitler to their enemies, not the other way round. Uh, however, we move on from him, and popular history now, I suppose, is dominated by uh, the Vegas and the Kershaws and the, the, the popular history yep. now. No. I mean, do you forget long last we've got it right? Or is it an interesting I'm enthused. Um, sort of, but there's a lot more to do. There's a lot. I mean, people think that Nazi Germany and the Holocaust has been done to death. But actually, there's a huge amount to do. I mean, for example, I've never mentioned gender. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there's a whole corpus of books to do with gender and the camps and the Holocaust and Nazism and the role of women. Um, I just threw that to one side uh, out rather. But yeah, the, the Kershaw is his biography of Hitler, two volumes, is just brilliant, I think. The way he's brought together so it's not great men make history. But on the other hand, no Hitler, no Holocaust. So how to weave together huge historical movements with the activities of, of one person and his and his friends, his cohorts. I mean, I've hinted at it a bit, so that the history of the Third Reich has changed over the years. And there's no doubt that now the focus is the East and the Holocaust. That's where the focus is. Prior to that, the focus has been, uh, was Hitler a strong dictator or a weak dictator? Was the Third Reich a fully paid off, fantastic dictatorship or was it chaotic? Yeah? Were the German people imprisoned by the Hitler gang or was he incredibly popular and successful and if he'd stopped before he went into the Soviet Union, that would be. So I, I, I take your point that women's fashion is in and out of fashion. Mm -hmm. But I think AJP Taylor won't come back in fashion. We must wind up in a moment. Right. But, um, I, I, I was pretty struck when you dropped into your um, talk about how the SA had chaplains yeah. very much yeah. embedded in their organisation. Yeah. 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 And I'm wondering if there have been any studies done of um, chaplains 
uh, in the German army, and um, perhaps were the chaplains of the SS? I mean, I don't know. What, you know, what was the church's role yeah, yeah. kind of embedded in? There, there were military the chaplains in the army in the Luftwaffe, and uh, there are books uh, about, about them. Uh, there, I'm doing a study of one particular Lutheran pastor who was a chaplain to an SA group, storm troop group, and he wore, um, he went to church in his brown shirt and put his robes on over it, as many other pastors did. So, and they were true believers, you see, they were true believers. Got to get, that's the other thing I think that's, that's come new in the last 10 years. But particularly the, the headquarters corps of the SS were true believers. Yeah. Highly educated, very cultured, degrees coming out of their arms, you know, lots of them theologians. But they were quite clear that to rebuild Germany as a great nation as she had been before the First World War, they had to deal with Jewish influence. Now they were they were not the kind of people to throw stones and they looked with distaste on that kind of action. What had to happen was that the Jews had to emigrate. That was the solution. And then, of course, it all got radicalized um, because the army and SS very quickly in Eastern Europe started murdering Jews en masse and Polish intellectuals. And it, it clicked with the senior uh, National Socialists. They could actually murder one them. And so these sporadic shootings became the order of the day in Eastern Europe. And then became so appalling for the soldiers that they invented the death camp. Final comment from the Yes. Um, the Nazis weren't simply um, intent on exterminating the Jews. They also no, no. wanted to exterminate yeah. the Poles, the Ukrainians, the Russians, create a huge sort of yeah. no, it was clean sweep in the East. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what was to, the attitude of the Lutheran Church to that? They were going to deport. They were going to kill as many as possible. Kill all Jews. Kill all intellectuals. Uh, deport people way into Russia and replace them with ethnic Germans, people of Polish or ethnic Germans. They build castle fortifications by the Europeans, linked with autobahns. I mean, the whole thing was megalomaniac. Just absolutely. You, what, a lot of what you said has been addressed to the specifically the Jewish problem. Yeah. But this isn't just a Jewish problem. No, no. It's not bigger than that. No, it's about Slavs, Bunta Mensch, and the Slavs. Certainly all, all Catholic priests, the Polish priests, all the Catholic all the Muslims, all Catholics. Yeah. Well, they reckon, I mean, what's the reckoning of it? Six million Jews, 20 odd plus million. Uh, so this is, and then add all, add all the millions of women, six million Poles, non-Jewish. Non but there was no protest about this even before. Yeah. Well, some churches in the East did, not many. But you have to realize that this, this was unbelievable. Mm. <laughs> actually got rid of this was unbelievable. Yeah. It wasn't just or even the killing of the Polish and the Jews. This is just not believable. Jews didn't believe. Mm. Um, the quote I like is a, a survivor of, Ar of Auschwitz who says, I was at Auschwitz and I still don't believe it. The complete gratuitous cross. <coughs> SS didn't have chaplains, but there is an uh, example of SS barracks in Germany which had church services 
Well, it's been a pleasure. On that sombre note, and uh, perhaps weighed down a bit by, by some of this history, um, a, a fine word of thanks to you, Ian. Thank you for coming to be with us. And thank you for all that you uh, shared with us about the research you've been doing. Thank you for fielding questions and comments as well. I don't know what you feel. I feel kind of slightly shell shocked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but, but nonetheless, really pleased I've been here because yeah. it's um, you know, been an yeah. important thing to, to wrestle with. So, Ian, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.